Good evening, everyone. My name is Juliana Oñate. I'm the Executive Director of the Monrovia Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all so much for being here tonight, and thank you to all the candidates for being in attendance. Round of applause for everyone. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to make a note that we've got a couple card runners, so if you don't have a card yet and you'd like to potentially submit a question, please raise your hand so they can come bring you an index card. Um, if you have an index card ready to submit, make sure it says whether it's for the mayor or for the uh, city council candidates. That way we know who it's supposed to go to, and then one of the card runners will collect it from you and bring it over to our moderators. Okay? Thank you so much. And at this time, I would like to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could please stand and put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the moderator of this event, Robbie Davis. Thank you, Robbie. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, welcome to the Monrovia City Council and the Mayoral Candidate Forum. Um, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce, to the candidates, and to all of you for your participation. Uh, my name is Robbie Davis, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of the Pasadena area, which includes Monrovia as one of the communities that we serve. Um, uh, the League's charter is to promote um, involved and active, um, informed participation in government. Um, we study and act on public policy issues, but we never endorse or support candidates or parties. And we assist in forums like this as part of our voter service program. Uh, before we go any further, I want to introduce uh, the rest of the league team. In addition to me, we have um, Hester Bell, who will be serving as timekeeper. And we also have Jean Boon Nagel and Cheryl Rose, who are question sorters. Um, so this forum will be in two parts. First, you will hear uh, for the candidates for the Monrovia City Council, and then after a very brief break, um, you will hear uh, from the candidates for mayor. Um, all the candidates have agreed to the following procedures. Each candidate will make an opening statement, um, one minute for the council candidates and two minutes for the mayor's candidates. Uh, the timekeeper will keep the candidates informed of the time remaining and will raise a red card when his or her time has elapsed. And once that she'll do 15 seconds and then stop. Um, and when your time has elapsed, um, please conclude your response as quickly as possible. Um, after the opening statements are completed, candidates will begin answering uh, written questions from the audience. And again, there's going to be runners circulating um, with through the room with cards and pencils, and uh, we'll be delivering your questions to the question sorters. Um, hold if you do have a question, hold your card up so they can see you. Um, the following rules um, we have uh, about all the submissions: uh, they must be in the form of a question and not a statement. Uh, they may be directed at one. Uh, candidate or all, but we will allow all the candidates to answer every question. There will be no rebuttals. And the questions must deal with the issues of the election. Um, no personal references or attacks will be allowed. Um, please note that the questions are sorted just to clarify language, to combine duplicates, and to eliminate any that are an attack on a candidate. Um, if you feel your question has been misinterpreted, you may submit another. And due to time limitations, um, not every question may be asked, but feel free to discuss issues with the candidates afterwards. Um, each candidate will have one minute to answer each question, and again, that'll be tracked by the timekeeper. Um, when the audience question period is over, um, candidates will do their closing statements, and again, those will be one minute. And the candidates drew numbers um, ahead of time, so that's the order that they're in now, the numbers that they drew, and we'll rotate, so not every candidate answers, answers the que question first each time. Um, so, and finally, we just want to remind you that league politics that uh, specified that there be no campaign activity inside this room. Um, and um, we request that everyone either t turn your cell phone off 
or put it on silent um, just to show respect for the candidates and the other audience members. So if there are no questions, let's get started. Uh, the three candidates that you see here now are competing for two seats on the Monrovia City Council. There is a, th a fourth candidate, uh, but we received notice yesterday that she is not able to participate. Um, so, uh, and this is a term of four years for the City Council. So, um, opening statements will begin now. Uh, you have one minute, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Rojas. Hi, first of all, thank you, Chamber and the League of Women uh, for hosting us. My name is Jesus Rojas, and, and I'm not a politician. I'm a homeowner, and I work as a police officer. I have 18 years of law enforcement experience. I'm here today because I know firsthand how crime, one incident, one radio call can impact families or change the lives of families forever. According to Crime Mapping, which is on the Monrovia City page for the month of January and December, each month here in Monrovia, our city has averaged roughly 45 physical attacks 45 burglaries, 40 stolen cars, 50 shoplifters, and just the other day, the city experienced its first murder for the year. I understand safety better than everyone else here, and public safety is my priority. If elected, I want to address the staffing shortage for the Monrovia PD, which is currently short-staffed by eight officers. Currently, there is one school resource officer covering all Monrovia schools. I'm not saying our schools are bad, but I propose bringing in two additional school officers to bring in additional safety. I propose in CCT cameras and license plate readers to the downtown Monrovia area and surrounding okay. for crime prevention. Thank, thank you. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, I hate interrupting, but there. Um, next, uh, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters. I want to thank also the Chamber of Commerce for this event and those that are here in person. I appreciate your enthusiasm for this event. The right direction for Monrovia is someone with experience. I am a third generation Monrovian, a businessman who brought ABC roofing supply to Monrovia that's consistently been in the top 20 sales tax producers for the city of Monrovia for the last 20 years. I have a BA, an MBA, and a JD, Juris Doctor Law degree. I have one year, six months experience as an appointed council member here in Monrovia. I have nine years of experience as a historical preservation commissioner, including as chair 12 years a member of the Monrovia-based Volunteer Center of the San Gabriel Valley, 10 years on the Make a Difference State Committee, three years as a board member of MOPEG, a total of 11 years with MOPEG, that's a Monrovia Historical Preservation Group, and chair of the Monrovia Art and Public Places Committee. I have been involved and committed in Monrovia and thank, hope thank to you. do so. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Belden. Good evening. Before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you to the League of Women Voters and our Monrovia Chamber of Commerce and everyone else out here and those on watching on TV for just uh, keeping democracy alive. So thank you. We're living in challenging times. Monrovia does need leaders that have experience and know how to deliver for our community and will be ready day one. I spent my career more than 20 years working to improve the quality of life in our communities by implementing solutions for our mental health, our physical health, and our economic health. I've started to run a small business. I've worked for local and national nonprofit organizations, and I've worked in go city government and the executive level. When government, I know when government can be effective, but I also know when it can get in the way. I've raised more than $40 million for projects and programs to help restore our watersheds, our forests, provide jobs for underserved youth, and I want to keep Monroe moving forward. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll start with um, questions. So uh, let's see, for the first one, uh, how do you plan to involve residents in the decision-making process in Monrovia as a member of the city council? And we'll start with Mr. Jimenez. I think holding public meetings like the ones that are going to be scheduled for the Monroe Project and the Oak Park Apartments, these are vital uh issues that need to be addressed. What is our housing stock going to look like? Are we going to permit a New Yorkization of Monrovia? So public meetings is the way to get input fr uh, from uh, everyday citizens. I think that's the best way to go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden, involving residents in decision making. Sure. Well, I'm running for city council to be a representative of everyone here in Monrovia. So I want to look, listen to all the diverse voices and perspectives 
to make sure they're heard. That's really important. I think that it's a big challenge to make sure that we understand what everyone is thinking. We need more avenues to do that. Uh, I think that online polls are a great way to do that and enhance outreach, but it also means going to people where they are. So going to the schools, going to the communities, going to the organizations, and hear from them there. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Rojas. I think keeping an open uh, communication with the community, uh, committees, surveys, and that's what we're here. Just like when uh, as a police officer and I respond to a call, we need to listen to our customer base and see what's going on and go from there. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. How important is regular participation in council and commission meetings in the role of becoming a member of the city council? And we'll start with Mr. Belden. Can I ask a clarification? Is that for our participation or for the community? For you. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see. Well, I think it's really important. I, when, one of the things that makes Minerva so unique is how active we are. Uh, it, it's fantastic. I serve on the Community Services Commission. We have regular attendance by one of our council members there and vice versa. We like to go to the city council members' meetings as often as possible. Many people are watching them on TV. It's important to be at all these different locations and all these different meetings so you can hear all those perspectives that we were just talking about in the first question and understand what people are thinking, what's on their mind, and how, most importantly, how these all are linked together from school board to the city council because all these decisions really make a difference to our community here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rojas. Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. How important is regular participation in council and commission meetings in the role of becoming a member of the city council? So I agree with Mr. Billen. I definitely agree that city council members should participate in every uh, event possible to be part of the community and listen to their concerns and just be involved. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jimenez. I have been a commissioner for, I was a commissioner for nine years, and I think I missed one meeting in those nine years, and that was for my daughter's graduation. As a council member, I missed one meeting in the year and a half I've had, and that was in a council-related uh, water trip conference uh, in Sacramento. So I think it's very important, and I've shown my commitment by missing very, very few meetings. If you look at my Facebook and Instagram, you'll see just how important I consider it being out and about in the community. It's part of the job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Um, are you using social media to promote your candidacy? And we'll start with Mr. Rojas. So I'm old enough that I, I didn't have social media before. And uh, this is the first time I opened up an Instagram. Uh, I mean, I remember when MySpace was a thing, and and uh, but you know that's how old I am. So, but I, and I started it for for because I'm running for city council, and that was the request uh, of uh, my friends and family that are helping me with this. But definitely, this is the first time that I have social media. I've never been a person that's uh, on the phone for social media. Okay, um, Mr. Jimenez. I confess that at first I was not. Very good at social media, but I, again, as I said, if you look at my Facebook and my Instagram, I think I have something like, how many posts? Like 170 posts in, in less than two years. And it's the way to communicate, especially with younger people. They need to see where you are, and that's, that's the way to do it nowadays. So I'm very active on social media. And Mr. Belden. It's the way we talk to everyone these days, right? So... Um... I, of course, I do have <laughs> campaign information going out on social media, and I, I think it's also a great avenue to learn more from the community, what's important to them, what they can easily connect to us as well. And I, I assume that, and maybe some of the other questions will come up later, but um, it's important for the city to do that and keep doing that. Thank you. Um, okay, here's one. Um, there's a need for affordable housing regionally. Do you support enacting an inclusionary zoning ordinance, um, incentivizing homeowners to build uh, accessory dwelling units, creating overlay zones, um, and committing to studying a community land trust? So basically all the things that have to do with affordable housing. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Jimenez. All right. Well, first of all, I'm in favor of inclusionary zoning. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, what it is is 
uh, requiring that any new developments, underlying new uh, developments that come into the city for multiple uh, 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 family dwellings have a certain set aside number for low income units. Now, the per exact percentage would depend on the sliding scale how big or how many units the, the, the apartment uh, building would have. I also think that ADUs, that's something that we have in our uh, option for our single family dwelling neighborhoods. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, in the old days, they used to call it granny flats. Because no disrespect to senior citizens, because that's where you would put your 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 grandparents or your older citizens. Uh, we're doing that here in Monrovia, and uh, we need to also look at land trusts and other options uh, for housing. Uh, people shouldn't have to move out of Monrovia. Your children or your grand or your grandparents because they can't afford to live in Monrovia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Belden. We have an affordability crisis, so we need to take a multifaceted approach to address it. We need to use everything within our, our means to promote uh, housing inclusion, inclusionary zoning ordinance and housing to make sure that, yes, uh, new developments that are large developments that are seeking uh, discretionary approvals, that they are going to be providing a certain threshold. It's maybe about 10 to 20 percent affordable, which is common in Southern California now. We don't have it in Monrovia, but it's common in Pasadena, even South Pasadena, which is a very small community, has that in place. Um, I'd also would support uh, encouraging more ADU development. Uh, of course, all this development, though, does have to have the same character that's right for Monrovia and has to have input from the community. So we need to continue that as well. Um, a land trust is something that could work as well. Obviously, we just need to fund it and find funding that maybe is from the state or federal side, don't have to do it just ourselves. But we should really encourage people and make it easier for people to put in low-income housing, senior housing, and so that people in Monrovia can stay in Monrovia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rojas. I support affordable housing and actually met with a developer because I wanted to pick the brain to see what, as a council member, we need to do to support or make this happen. So I would like to explore any city-owned property um, to make committees or, or surveys with the community to see if it's appropriate to go there. Yeah. Because a developer told me there's certain costs that they cannot ignore, such as skilled labor material. And uh, as Mr. Belden just mentioned, um, as a council member, I would like to explore what other uh, grants or uh, alternative funding sources there are to make it a, a goal to create funding um, possible or, or, or lower down the cost of building to ensure that we could house our, our community in need for this. And also, uh, as for renting, maybe we could also target a goal or where we need to have our families uh, afford to live somewhere. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, this is kind of a big one. In your view, what are three top issues facing Monrovia today? And um, how would you go about addressing them? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Belden. So my first two are the same level here, but safety, of course, is key. We want to make sure that everyone in our community feels comfortable walking outside their house, have a, uh, it's safe walking to school, enjoying their parks. We have an amazing community policing model that we've used here, and we also have an amazing fire department. And I uh, want to make sure that they have the resources they need. We've heard recently uh, two incidents um, from both fire and police chief that the city council has provided the resources they need to do such great work at putting out the fire at Brad Oaks or addressing and arresting uh, um, someone for the murder recently. Um, at the same time, affordable housing is key. And it's my second item. Mm -hmm. And my third item that I'm going to run out of time on <laughs> here is making sure we have a healthy community and looking and ensuring that we have good access to parks. We have a dress our air quality, our water quality, and most importantly, shade. Thank so you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, three uh, most important issues facing um, Monrovia. Mr. Rojas. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to address the staffing issue for the Monrovia, Monrovia PD. I would also like to hire additional firefighters to keep up with the new developments and also uh, explore what technology or tools they need to address any potential fire. For example, let's say with the tallest building, if there was a fire, what, what do they need to extinguish that fire? And also on house uh, community, 
Uh, we, we know that it, that it exists, and I propose bringing in a civilian non-police response team to alleviate the radio calls that our law enforcement responds to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jimenez. The number one priority of government is public safety. If you don't feel safe in your home, what else is more important than that? I think we need to have a relationship with our first responders, and I feel I have that. I've met with the Police Officer Association, with the chief. We have to make sure that they have the resources to do their job. Number two is loss of local control, and this piggybacks on housing. Loss of local control to Sacramento to be able to decide what our city's housing stock is going to look like. And housing itself, the third issue. Um, I'm for inclusionary zoning, as I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, we have a uh, shortage of affordable housing here in Monrovia, and we have to look at the various ways that we can make Monrovia affordable for different income levels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this kind of dovetails with the um, question earlier about uh, social media, but how do you plan to communicate with your constituents as a council member? And uh, we'll start with Mr. Rojas. So as I confessed earlier, I need to be better in social media. Uh, working for the police department, uh, we post stuff all the time, and I know it works. But uh, I got to work on that myself. But because I'm still kind of old school, I plan on giving everybody my cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Jimenez. Um, you probably already received my mailer. It arrived uh, either... Tuesday or today in the mail. I'm going to be also uh, distributing door hangers, uh, reminding people to vote for me as a follow-up to that, going door to door. And I'm also on Instagram, on Facebook, and I have a well, what I feel is a well-developed uh, website, which will give me a lot more than one minute to answer some of these questions. <laughs> so I invite people to go there, and you could see what my priorities are, what my ideas are for Monrovia. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Belden, communicating with your constituents. If I'm honored enough to serve as your next city council member, I'm going to make sure that, I, well, you already ha you'll have my phone number and my email if you don't already, but in the mailer as well. Um, and I think it's just making sure that there are uh, regular opportunities for communication. So opportunities to go have a coffee with me. I'd like to do that on a monthly basis. Our wonderful shops and restaurants here in town. And, of course, attending all the amazing events that we have and the, and the, the remarkable organizations and just keeping in touch with those people. Um, but uh, we do have a small town feel, and it's nice that I know so many of you out there, and I'd love to look forward to getting to know even more of you. Thank you. Thank you. And this kind of dovetails also with getting in touch with, with uh, the constituents. Please tell us your nonprofit um, organizational charity involvement in Monrovia. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Jimenez. All right. My run for council has its beginnings in volunteerism. I first got involved with the Volunteer Center of the San Gabriel Valley, based here in Monrovia. And I grew to respect the people at the helm, the director, uh, Peña Arroyo, now Macy Gracia. So I've been with them, gosh, I, I lose track of how many years, 12, 13 years I've been involved with them. As an offshoot of that, I got involved in the Make a Difference Day committee in October. That's when we have our big event. Um, Alex de Tocqueville, a European philosopher, came to America in 1800 said, America is a nation of joiners. That's translated into volunteers. So I took that to heart, and I think it's volunteers that make Monrovia go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden. So I'm currently the president of the Monterey Parks Wilderness Recreation Foundation. It's a, an organization that's been helping to raise funds for our parks, our open space. Just helped raise $75,000 for the library shade structure over the playground there so kids can use that amenity all times of the day. Um, but I've also worked in, for the Council for Watershed Health, helping to build green infrastructure projects, worked for the National Forest Foundation, helping to restore our forests and our watersheds above us. And... I've, I've had the pleasure to work with many other great orgs, such as Migos de los Rios, who's doing much incredible work, Food Ed here, right here in Monrovia, and uh, the LA Conservation Corps and San Gabriel Conservation Corps, so that youth from underserved communities have a chance to gain new career skills, which is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rojas. 
So for the uh, Amani Police Department where I work, I work out of the Community Relations Office. And uh, a lot of the stuff that we do is uh, a copy with a cop, a lot of special <laughs> events. We give out toys to the community. And what I plan on doing if elected to City Council is uh, providing the police department with uh, what I learned in working in Omani to uh, enhance the community relations aspect here in Monrovia. And uh, over the course of the, my career, I had the privilege of working with Union Station, Volunteers of America, and several organizations that just kind of tend to overlap because we kind of share the same problems. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, what do you think is the best way of dealing with conflict? And we'll start with Mr. Belden. That's a great question. I, well, the best way to deal with conflict, I think, is to listen. And just conflict usually arises from disagreements. And that's when people are not really understand where each other are coming from. Listening, I think, is one of the most important skills we always should have and use. And that's, I think, the best thing to do is really to understand where people are coming from, listen to what their grievances are, their issues are, if they're either personal or if they're um, about something else that's going on uh, that doesn't have to do with me, hopefully, but maybe it will. Um, and, and then to find some common ground and find some solutions that we can all work together on. And, and hopefully that will put us in a better place. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rojas. So I think I have a lot of experience dealing with conflict, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, whether it's big or small, you, you need to pay attention and listen to uh, your residents and find uh, wh what they need and how you can help them out. Sometimes they just need a vent, but nevertheless, you, you need to at least make them feel like you helped them out. Okay, Mr. Jimenez. I agree. It's first listening. Um, what I said at my campaign kickoff, I'm not here so much to talk as I am here to listen. And I've tried to uh, put that into action the year and a half that I've been on the city council to be a good listener. I think that is the basis of conflict. People aren't listening to each other. They're talking over each other. Um, so I do think that that is the key. Overcome conflict through listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, describe your financial experience, especially as it relates to managing a budget. And we'll start with Mr. Rojas. So I'm also part of the Rio Hondo uh, College Foundation, and uh, obviously money is key. Uh, you, without money, the city won't function, but it's kind of like managing your, your personal life. Uh, what can you afford what's really needed and what can you not, not need? And you also want to make sure that you have a, a balance for an emergency or an extra cash flow for an emergency. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the city is financially stable and we're not overspending and that uh, at the same time, we're, we're keeping our residents happy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jimenez. As a Monrovia City Council member, we look at the budget. Monrovia is in good shape financially, and I think that the current council has been good stewards of that because we've looked at the budget, we've looked at the needs. And in part answer to my last question, we listen. We listen to the citizens, their priorities, and what we can afford. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden. I mentioned earlier that I was a, uh, used to run my own small business. I started that as well. I, I understand how it can be challenging to make sure there's enough cash flow to pay your bills, to make sure your employees get paid on a regular basis, and at the same time your vendors are paid. But I also have experience, and I think it's on my <laughs> my job title on the ballot, uh, project manager. So I, I manage multi-million dollar projects on a daily basis as well. And that means you're looking at budgets on a daily basis. You're understanding where uh, your cash flow is going. But more importantly, you're understanding where you need to go get other funding, which is what I do as well, write grants to seek those other dollars. Um, I've also managed dollar uh, money and financial uh, just for as a treasurer for nonprofit organizations as well. So. Thank you. Um, this sort of kind of goes along with this um, as far as finances. It says, two years ago, the city sent out a survey asking how we should spend Measure K money. How would you recommend spending it? And we'll start with Mr. Jimenez. I think we should listen to the citizens and spend it as the citizens chose on that survey. You can have great ideas on how you want to spend it as a council member, but you need to listen to the people. Look at the survey and spend it accordingly. Thank you. 
Mr. Belden. It is Minerva's money, which is all our community's money. It's not my money. It's not the council's money. Uh, so we are yeah, looking back at the comments. There were more than 240 residents that participated and provided nearly 500 comments on ideas of where we could spend those dollars. It's always important to look back at that. Um, at the same time, it is important to make sure that Minerva is on a strong footing financially. So I think it's been wise that we've made sure we uh, have reserves available as, as well. Um, but I want to make sure we do have uh, addressed the needs in the community. And I've already mentioned some of those that I think are key. And if we can find ways to address those, which are the ones that are most pressing in the community, we should put some of those funds towards those resources. Uh, thank you. Mr. Rojas. So public safety is my number one priority. And something that I discovered that the Monrovia PD uh, does not have is its own armored vehicle, a Bearcat. So they actually share, share the vehicle with multi-agencies. And I propose um, giving them their, their own equipment where they don't have to share it with anyone else. And at the same time, um, a concern that just listening to the fire department was that their concern is the new um, high-rise buildings. So I want to make sure that they have the, the tools and everything they have to make sure they could extinguish any fire, whether it's the first floor or the top floor. And lastly, uh, as Mr. Jimenez mentioned, uh, we do need to listen to the community. It's, it's their money, and uh, we need to spend it accordingly to how it's best fit. And, and lastly, uh, I'm not sure how long this uh, measure case is supposed to last, but uh, I, I know there's $60 million in, in that account. And then I also wonder if it's at some time at, as a homeowner, if we want to keep on having that and are added to our property taxes. Okay, thank you. Um, the city and uh, Monrovia USD are different entities, but they need to work together. How would you facilitate cooperation between the city and the schools? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Belden. I mentioned earlier that it's really important for our school district and our city governments to both work together well. And I think having regular meetings, there's some, and I know in the history, it, it's been ebbed and flowed, I guess, in, in the term of number of meetings. But I think having a regular quarterly meeting is important. And obviously many of us see each other at the different events, but there needs to be just that opportunity to really um, have joint meetings and discuss openly about ways we can work together and collaborate more. Um, because at the end of the day, someone's there for eight hours and then they're out of school and we should provide services as well just to them and vice versa. If we can have our schools open as parks, we should try to do that. It's happened in the past. And we should also make sure we provide programs and support for those youth when they're outside of school. Uh, thank you. Mr. Rojas. So I worked as a school resource officer and I learned the importance of working with your local school board. And uh, if elected as a city council member, I want to be able to work with them closely and find out what they need, what resources they need to improve the school sites and uh, help each other out. Because ultimately, I believe that as we need to keep all of our school sites safe. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, there's, there, as, a, as a police officer, I think that all schools are just naturally soft targets. But nevertheless, uh, if they need more money to uh, infrastructure or whatever the case may be, I feel like we definitely need to help them out because uh, improving our schools definitely improves the property value. And I think that's that's important for whether you're, um, anyone that's in early young age or, or has been a homeowner for 80 years. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jimenez. I have a great relationship with the schools. Uh, I'm endorsed by four out of the five Monrovia uh, school board members. I've met with them. I've talked with them. I talked with the previous superintendent. Yes, in the past there was a rocky relationship, but that has changed. Uh, it's much improved now. And I see a future partnership, uh, which consists of the parents who teach the kids the values. Number two, the school district that teaches the kids. And number three, the Monrovia city government that provides all these leadership opportunities with the uh, yes, internship program with the Youth Commission, with the Teen Advisory Board, as well as the Junior Map. It's a partnership for the future for our kids because Monrovia's future is its kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question here about uh, Monrovia utilities. It says they seem to be increasing regularly over the past three years, uh, water and sewer increase that will occur annually in 2027. 
um, and the person's asking, wasn't the new construction supposed to bear the burden of additional water sewer charges? Um, can you address the concern residents have um, about these annual increases? And uh, we'll start with Mr. Rojas. I have to admit, I don't know enough uh, how to solve that at, uh, or answer that question right now, but I would definitely like to explore and uh, how to lower down the cost of stuff. And I, I think it's really important. Uh, I think of our retired community and especially when they're living on fixed income, uh, they don't want to have higher bills. So we also keep have to keep them in mind and what they could afford and, and make sure that they're still uh, able to buy all their essential needs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rojas, or Mr. Jimenez. Thank you. Um, I had heard rumors that people were saying that Monrovia had the highest water rates in the San Gabriel Valley. So I asked city staff about that. And uh, at a council meeting on January 16, 2024, AR2, there was a city council report on how much Monrovia, uh, Monrovians really pay in water. Uh, the, the city of Monrovia hired NBS government finance group to do a survey and the actual figures, and I'm, I'm looking at the actual report right here in front of me right now, the sewer rate, uh, Monroe was the third lowest in the San Gabriel Valley and it's right here. And further, with regards to the water rates, uh, Monrovia was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, the ninth lowest, and there's a lot more higher than, than, than nine. So it answered my question, my concerns. Um, I think that we're all, we'd all like to pay less for water. Uh, we haven't had an increase in two years. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Belden. We have an affordability crisis in general right now. Uh, a lot of folks are rent burdened and the high cost of housing. So I can understand where people are coming from. If they have, um, we obviously want people to be able to afford to go out for dinner or shop at our local stores as well. So I can understand the concern. Um, I think that we can do everything in our power, and I think this I, city council has done that to make sure that our costs are only increasing when there are those expenses that we've seen. Um, it's Everything has gone up. Inflation is a little out of control at the moment. So those are the reactions that we're seeing with those cost increases to make sure that we can continue to provide water to, to the residents and make sure that our water pipes aren't going to break at the same time. <laughs> But Good. Um, what we can do to make sure we can find creative solutions to reduce those costs is important as well. Thank you. Um, different topic. What would be your plan for Monrovia's homeless problem? And we'll start with Mr. Jimenez. There's no magic wand that you can wave to the homeless uh, situation. The first priority for me is you have to look at people who are willing to help themselves, who are willing to to be helped. Uh, Monrovia has a homeless prevention program. This homeless prevention program has consisted of community services, the Foothill Unity Center, and Monrovia PD. According to LASHA, Los Angeles Homeless um, Services Authority, the homeless number in Monrovia has been cut in half. They do a census every year. I participated in the 22 um, census that they did. I'm committed to continue Monrovia's program. And again, you have to be uh, willing to reach out to those that are willing to help themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden. Homeless, this is a regional problem, and we're, we see it every day. We experience it here in Minervia, and we need to continue to work at a regional level, at a local level, but we can do more here too. There's a new bill that just passed, which will allow our faith communities to look at providing affordable housing on their own properties as well. That's something we should look at and continue to work with them. I know there's like at least one that's already interested in working on that here locally, uh, work with our COGS, and continue to do that. Um, we do need to make sure that we understand that people are experiencing homelessness for many different reasons. Um, there's a lot of families out there that are, are currently being evicted just because the rent increases and can no longer find a place that's affordable to live here in Southern California. So to be compassionate, but also understanding and make sure we... Um, do as much as we can to get people that are capable and willing to participate in housing, give them those options so they have those resources available. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rojas. 
I actually put it in my bail statement for our in-house population uh, that I wanted to bring in a civilian not, uh, team and that I actually listed CityNet. And not that I'm committed to CityNet, but it, they, they are probably the best example out there right now to address the homeless population. Uh, currently, the city of Amani has contracted their services, and I want to say that they're really effective. And to the point where I, I know it's voluntary to address uh, the needs that they want, but pretty honest, they're kind of they, they could be annoying to the homeless, and then to the point where the homeless actually listen to them, and then they go to the, the shelters or wherever they they want they need to be placed at. Now, as a police officer, I actually took the liberty of taking, uh, well, on, on my on my time off, the goal line, because I wanted to see how it was. And I actually thought that uh, if I were to be elected, I want to address probably like a overtime detail or uh, to for officers, uniform officers to be participating in the goal line so that way our, our population can feel a little safer. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, what specific actions can the city do itself for combating the climate crisis? And would you support a city environmental advisory commission? And we'll start with Mr. Belden. I spent a good portion of my career helping to protect and preserve our environment. And there's a lot we can do locally to solve the climate crisis from helping to focus on decarbonizing our own city buildings, uh, our own city fleet to make sure that they're no longer providing emissions that affect us personally from our own air quality here. And at the same time, we have an opportunity to look at what else the community we can help them with. And so having a, a council or a, an advisory council, it might be a good idea. We just need to make sure that we're providing them and that we understand what their role is. If it's an effective organization, then that would be that would serve us well. We have many commissions already, so if we need another one, maybe that's the way to go. Otherwise, I think there's many ways we can currently do that. And most importantly, I'll just end on this, that having a plan for how we're going to address those uh, changes is really important and understanding where we, where we currently are so we have a baseline. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Rojas. So I actually got this idea from uh, just walking and talking to uh, um, our residents. And uh, a big concern was uh, EV or electric charging stations in our downtown um, Monrovia area. So I I'm definitely support a green initiative and uh, finding uh, funding sources and where our residents could shop, watch a movie, and if they own an electric car. And I know there's a, ma a state mandate, but we definitely need to improve as a city and in our infrastructure to make this happen for, for our community. Uh, thank you. Mr. Jimenez. Um, well, first of all, I voted for the Clean Power Alliance, um, and I do also believe that we need to have more charging stations uh, throughout Monrovia. I have, Will Monroe once said to his workers when he was setting out Monrovia, clear the land but leave the trees. It's the beauty of the place. And I think that we can use that, take it to heart today in planting more trees. And finally, I would support an advisory commission on the environment. Those are my four points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, this one just came in. How can the city combat the threat of retail theft rings targeting our businesses? And we'll start with Mr. Rojas. Well, number one, uh, we need to address the staffing issue for the police department. As uh, having a law enforcement experience myself, uh, patrol services is normally tend to be a reactive force, meaning that the crime already happened and they're just responding to either uh, address the immediate issue or take a police report. So what, what happens when the police department is actually fully staffed or have extra bodies? They're able to uh, have crime suppression units. At the same time, um, I was trying to, or, or I would like to address uh, bringing in additional CCT cameras and, and, and several license plate readers. I know the city currently has eight of them, but just so you guys know, in the city of Almani, by the end of 2024, they're going to have about 45 license plate readers, and they're about halfway into this number, and they're highly effective. We're able to solve crimes within minutes. Thank you. Mr. Jimenez. I think that I agree that we've been just reacting to a lot of the retail theft that's going on. 
Um, the other day when I went shopping, I think we went shopping for T-shirts, and uh, I was surprised that there was locked glass cases for T-shirts. Um, and that's a sad statement of how bad things have, have happened. But it is preventing the theft from happening so that I think that first responders can uh, uh, prioritize uh, more violent uh, incidents. Um, I went on a ride along and I was told, for example, at Burlington Coke Factory, because it's open a little bit later, that that is a site where there's quite a bit of, of retail theft. Apparently, if you're open a little bit later in the night, that uh, is an inspiration for people to go there and, and, and steal. But I think preventive measures would be better than just reacting and have our police officers having to go to, to those retail locations uh, to prevent a retail theft. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden. I went on a ride along with the Minerva Police Department on Friday night, and I was just so impressed by the quality of our police department already. And I think that uh, if they need additional resources, we should give them to them, of course. Um, but I do think we need to do a few things. One, uh, if we don't already have a task force, I think, I assume our chief is pretty much on top of these things, but there's probably a task force that we're working with our local uh, cities to make sure that we're addressing those larger rings that are happening in the community. Um, make sure we have more visibility. We have one, I think, decoy car. We should have a few more, so those are available to be put in front of all of those uh, stores that are having these experiences. And maybe even using some more of the uh, tools that we just implemented at Station Square, which is a tool that is kind of like a mobile um, uh, surveillance system that can also warn people. So that we have really quick reaction time if something has happened. And, and I think we do know where a lot of these uh, folks on a, a regular basis are, are having these instances. So we just need to make sure we have presence there. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, this goes back a little bit to some of the housing questions. So given the rising concerns about the impact of short-term rental properties on neighborhoods, um, do you have any thoughts about regulating uh, the purchase of single-family homes that are intended for short-term things like uh, for Airbnb? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Jimenez. Um, I don't like the the use of single family dwellings um, for Airbnb um, because a lot of times what happens is that there's um, parties that happen. Um, they're not people that are normally part of the fabric of the of the community, um, and I just I don't like to have uh, Airbnbs for single family dwellings that are unregulated. In other words, that are we, we can't identify them. We need to have a roster of those properties that are doing that. I think that's something that the police should have uh, because oftentimes it results in um, incidents. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Belden, short-term rentals. I think we should check how many short-term rentals we have in Monrovia. I think that would be a good place to start. I haven't heard it being a problem yet. Um, I d definitely understand where um, Councilmember Jimenez mentioned party houses. Uh, it, that's something that we definitely should crack down if it's happening. Uh, I, as we've already mentioned, I mentioned that we have a housing crisis, so uh, we need to make sure homes are available for people to rent long term or live in long term or purchase long term, not just so they sit around as a hotel. We have zoning. We put hotels where we want them, and we also receive the tax benefits from those. Uh, right now, we do not have a way, I don't think locally, to receive any of those tax benefits from short-term rentals. So we should look into it. I heard it wasn't a problem before, but we should double check because Monrovia is a popular city. So maybe people are starting to rent their homes on Airbnb. And I can definitely understand folks that are renting them out as an ADU for extra income because that makes sense too. It's hard right now. People need that extra income, but we do need to address it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Mr. Roja. I definitely agree that we should explore uh, to identify if how many Airbnbs or short-term rental properties there are in the city. And uh, I'm not sure if there is an ordinance, but if not, uh, we should explore putting together a committee and putting an ordinance in place. Um, and if that's the case, we should definitely have maybe designated areas. And as a law enforcement uh, officer, I also do agree with Mr. Jimenez where uh, the concern would be what if they start going out of control partying and um, and you don't know who's coming into the neighborhood. But if that's the case, we also ha need to have rules in place where we, maybe we 
if we have to, we have to find the property owners if they're not regulating their their short term rentals accordingly. Thank you. Um, Tell us what you know about current mental health programs in Monrovia, and um, is there anything that can be done to improve um, these programs? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Belden. <clears throat> the city just rolled out a new program to help uh, address calls that is, would typically be handled by the police service to uh, address those needs of folks that may be having any mental health uh, a crisis at the moment. So I think that's a great program that the city is offering now. And I know there's also a lot of resources in the community uh, that offer free counseling. There's some really, really great groups, uh, Inspire is one of them, um, and others that will provide counseling services when they're needed at no cost, and then help you put you in touch with the service uh, after that time as well. But there's resources available. So people do need to reach out. Please, if you have friends that are experiencing anything, um, let them know that there's some resources they can touch it, tap, tap into. And a lot of those are available on our city website as well as through the local organizations here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Rojas. As pre previously mentioned, uh, uh, I want to bring in a civilian non-police response team to the city. Uh, I do find it a, a, that sometimes it's not appropriate for a police officer to respond, but sometimes there is this instances where law enforcement needs to respond because the subject might be violent. Nevertheless, um, I think there could be more to address this issue. Um, there, it's an issue that's not going to go away, and we just need to make sure that all of our families are being um, safe. Thank you. Mr. Jimenez. The city of Monrovia rolled out February 5th. It's a uh, San Gabriel Valley Care Program, where we do have a mental health professional go out. The dispatcher determines whether it's a situation a police officer is required or a mental health expert is required. But these are reactionary 9-11 emergencies. We, we will do something within this year, short term, where we're going to not wait for a crisis, for someone desperate that might take their life. We're going to have a mental health response team. This is basically a clearinghouse of information so that people, they're not to the point where they need to call 9-11, but they're having issues, and they know they're having issues. So someone will be able to call, and they will be able to get information where they can get help. We shouldn't have to wait for an emergency. We need to be proactive and not just reactive when it's a 9-11 emergency. Thank you. Okay, and this will be our last question. If you had one goal to complete by the end of your first term, what would it be? And we will start with Mr. Rojas. One goal for, uh, for how long, I'm sorry? The for your first term. For my first term, definitely, uh, as I mentioned before, I want to make sure that our PD and fire department are taken care of. And I mean, as a resident myself, I, I want to make sure that I'm safe. So, and I want to make sure all of us are safe. I want to make sure that our families are safe in our parks, are traveling on the goal line, and just walking their walking in the neighborhood. Okay, um, Mr. Jimenez. I am against the New Yorkization of Monrovia skyline. My goal <laughs> will be for local control. I want to be able to use our historical resources. Monrovia has, has had great program for landmark and individual homes. We need to look at Pasadena. They concentrate on districts. And by having districts, if we can't save all of Monrovia from Sacramento's overreach, we can save big chunks of Monrovia, for example, our historical downtown, which the World Atlas said was one of the eight most significant historical downtowns in the state of California. So my wish, and it's a lofty one, is to be able to, to fight back against Sacramento and keep Monrovia the beautiful place that it is. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Belden. I mentioned safety was my number one priority, but you can't be safe if you don't have a home. Uh, you fundamentally need to have a place to live to feel safe. And so my number one priority is affordable housing and making sure that we find more resources and that can start with inclusionary zoning, bringing in more affordable housing developers that are interested in using and partnering with the city or just incentivizing ADUs. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll have our closing statements now, one minute, and we'll start with Mr. Belden. That was fast. <laughs> <laughs> Let me 
Just give me a moment. Minerva is facing many challenges that you've already heard tonight. We want to know how our children are going to be able to stay and live in Minerva, how we're going to protect Minerva's character with the new development, and how we're going to deal with climate change. Minerva needs experienced leaders that know how to get things done from day one. I've spent my career more than 20 years improving the quality of our community. On the first day, I'll be ready to do that for Monrovia. I'm honored to be endorsed by many Monrovia elected leaders, including Councilmember Gloria Credington, many commissioners, many community leaders, and many of the folks I see in the crowd today. So thank you for coming out. I'm a collaborative leader who works and wants to build a better community with everyone. I wanna make sure we have a healthy community, a safe community, and a prosperous community. We already have a great community, don't get me wrong. Monrovia is a special place, and I just wanna make it better. Thank you for your time. Mr. Jimenez. The right direction for Monrovia is somebody with experience. And that experience has been recognized by Monrovia's leaders. I have been endorsed by the entire Monrovia City Council, by four out of the five of the school board members, the Monrovia firefighters, the Foothill Community Democrats, 10 Monrovia City Commissioners, many business owners and residents, uh, State Senator Susan Rubio, Assemblywoman Blanca Rubio, and Assemblyman Chris Holden. The right direction for Monrovia are the right issues. Strong public safety, expanding more affordable housing, preserving Monrovia's historic identity, mental health, dealing with the, the unhoused among us by helping them, not judging them. Small business advocacy, and again, fighting the New Yorkization of Monrovia, the loss of local control to Sacramento. These are the issues that are the right direction for Monrovia. I thank you and humbly ask for your vote. Sergio Jimenez from Monrovia City Council, March 5th, 2024. Thank you and good night. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Rojas. Monrovia, like all surrounding cities, are no longer the small town cities they once were. Monrovia is becoming more cosmopolitan each day. With that in mind, one thing is guaranteed. Crime will increase, and I want to do my part to keep Monrovia safe. I have been endorsed by many elected officials, including Supervisor Hilda Solis, Supervisor Catherine Barger, Assemblymember Blanca Rubio, and Congresswoman Grace Napolitano in our Monrovia Fire Department. I am clearly the top choice for public safety, and if safety is your top concern, vote for Rojas. Thank you very much. So this concludes the city council portion of the forum. So I'd like to thank uh, the candidates for your participation and um, we'll have a quick break and the candidates for mayor will um, come to the podium. Thank you.
can get. So that's a canal that was cut. Well, the other thing that they seem to, like they keep saying, they keep seeing it in the North Second Okay, I'd like to welcome you to the second part of this forum, which is for the candidates for mayor of Monrovia. Uh, we have two candidates that are competing. Um, this is a two-year term. Um, and so, we again, uh, the candidates drew numbers, and that's determined the order of their speaking. And uh, so we will go ahead and leap right in to start with opening statements, and each candidate will have two minutes. So um, we will start with Mr. Spicer, your opening statement. Okay. First of all, I'm grateful to the League of Women Voters and the Monrovia Chamber of Commerce for hosting this forum. Thank you for allowing me to address this audience. It gives me another opportunity to mention why the choice for mayor is so important. As a native Monrovian, born, raised, and educated in this community, public schools, I am a living testament of the hope this all-American city can provide. I commend my opponent in this race because she's like me, lives and volunteers in Monrovia. We have made lots of progress together. We have and will continue to work together, but Monrovia needs a mayor with new ideas. My ideas will bring much needed housing, job training, and work development and make better use of the Gold Line Station Square Park area and improve services for our elderly and teens. Now, after 13 years of serving on this city council and 21 years of military service, I am prepared to be mayor on March 5th and to answer your questions starting now. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sheblin. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, and uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Monrovia Chamber of Commerce for facilitating this forum tonight. Monrovia, I humbly ask that you re-elect me as your mayor. At, we have work to do, and I truly believe I am the best qualified I am the best qualified to meet the challenges we face and to navigate the options we take to take us where we want and need to go. As mayor, more than ever, I bring proven years of leadership while also setting a tone of vision, commitment, passion, collaboration, and accessibility. Elected service in Monrovia is nonpartisan, and throughout my service, I have not sought nor received endorsements or funding from any political party or city public service provider. And although 100% behind the men and women of our police and fire departments and only wanting the very best for them in protecting our community, I also have not sought endorsement or funding from those employee groups. However, I have always, always asked for the endorsement from you, the people of Monrovia. I have more than strived to educate myself and bring back to Monrovia programs, best practices, and funding that have and will continue to include and address smart and innovative options for continued economic growth and stability, providing transparency and accountability for a balanced budget, measure K funds and grant funding, building and supporting strong public safety, public services, and critical infrastructure preservation, protection, and expansion of our historic homes and districts, creating more opportunities for public art, regional collaboration, and numerous platforms and entities on matters of homelessness, housing affordability, mental and public health, transportation, broadband connectivity, clean energy, and food recovery, to name a few. And always, always to provide accessibility to meet, listen, and collaborate on airing and resolving issues Vote Shevlin. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with um, audience questions. Um, and a lot of these will be the same as you've heard from the previous forum. Um, in your view, what are the top three issues facing Monrovia today? Um, and what would you suggest um, to accomplish to uh, implement uh, solutions? And we'll start with, um, let's see, Ms. She Ms. Shevlin. So the top three issues that we, okay. Um, first of all, I think public safety 
and uh, <coughs> financial stability and accountability are number one right at the, the top. That's always right there at the top. Um, housing, affordable housing, that is, is right there. And keeping our, our infrastructure and things like that in place and operating and doing, doing what it needs to do for our city. And then um, mental health. Mental health issues, mental health issues, and, and substance abuse, dealing with those and how they affect everyone in our, our community. Those are big. And then just sharing information. Communication is key. Uh, someone asked, what is one of the biggest challenges? And I think that's really getting the message out because if we all understand what the our challenges are, and we can all be kind of at least know what the the issues are. We can have those dialogues to. Thank you. Bring her out. Um, top top three issues, uh, Mr. Spicer. Yes, we all know number one is public safety, but we have we know we have a uh, affordable housing problem here in Monrovia, and also we have a problem with the um, homelessness. So. Regarding the, I believe with public safety, we're doing a good job. We give the um, officers what they need, the fire department what they need. Um, regarding the um, homelessness, I think I, I have talked to an outside um, gentleman who owned a commercial building, and it was just an idea of trying to put the homeless in, inside of a commercial building. But... Um, what I was told is the owner wouldn't mind doing it, but he was worried about having um, to take care of fixing the place back up at, at the end. Okay. Who Thank would you. pay for it? Thank you. Um, this is interesting. Um, very apropos for tonight. Did you agree with the measure? And I didn't, I don't know what, I didn't see uh, the number of that on the last ballot to eliminate elections for the mayor of Monrovia. And we'll start with Mr. Spicer. Uh, yes, ma'am. I wanted to um, just go ahead and give it back to the public so they can make a decision. I always wanted it to be a, um, a voting mayor seat. And um, I voted to have it to go back to the public in order for them to make the decision. And they made the decision and for voted mayor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chevlin. Uh Yes, that issue has been debated for many, many, many years. We did. We used to have a, a rotating mayor, and then uh, the citizens voted to eliminate that. Uh, but over the years, there's been a lot of uh, strife and problems uh, relating to that. But there are pluses and minus, minuses to that. Uh, but again, giving it back to the uh, citizens to make their own decision it had been, I want to say it was in the 70s that that uh, decision was made to go uh, to an elected mayor. Um, I think it's very important then to let the people speak, and they spoke. Uh, the measure failed miserably, um, and so they want, to vote, they want to vote in their mayor. So they have, they have spoken. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. In what new ways do you plan on bringing businesses, um, i.e. pubs, restaurants, et cetera, to Station Square? And we'll start with uh, Ms. Cheblin. Um, that is an issue. And until that area has been developed where there's, uh, uh, there's traffic in terms of, and not traffic, just cars, there's people uh, circulating in that area, we have a hard time attracting a bit an end user. Also, the cost of the depot that's down there has been remodeled. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. But for someone to come in there and actually operate a, a, a business or a restaurant, uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. Years ago, we estimated a million dollars. It's far surpassed that. So there's a major investment on any business that goes down there. So as the units become, they're, they're occupied and there's more people uh, around there and they can walk and circulate in the area, I think we'll be able to have a far better chance of attracting. The, the, uh, there has been a lot of, of uh, advertising and looking for an end user now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spicer. Yes. Um, with the transformation of the gold line and that area down there, 
um, it can serve as a really as a as a vital part. What I would like to see happen, and if I was the mayor, I would try and work with staff in order to have twice a year where we bring some of the young entrepreneurs down there and activate the um, walkway area so they can um, showcase their businesses and um, bring that old town feeling from uptown down here to the Station Square area to liven it up. That's what I would like to do. Okay, thank you. Um, in 2020, the city created a task force to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are your feelings about making this a permanent commission? And uh, Mr. Spicer? It seemed like it comes back pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe the commission, the commission did a heck of a job. Um, I, I can go back to Oliver um, when he was the city manager here. I was really complaining to him about there wasn't enough African Americans. That was on the staff of 250 people here. And um, I asked him, was there a way that he can start working on diversifying our staff? So our, when you walk into City Hall, or anywhere throughout the city where there's staff, it was a replica of our community. And so I believe if we brought the commission back, I wouldn't bring it back full time. I would bring it back twice a year to meet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chevlin. Uh, yes, I think the, the group that we put together to uh, look at these issues did an outstanding job. And there was a list of many items that we could, uh, we should, and we we are addressing going forward, uh, especially everything from uh, hiring to uh, offerings and any type of programming, things like that. Uh, and always with the lens to look at our services, whether that be through the community services, the library, our police, fire, uh, just hiring gen in general for our city, that we are trying to be as diverse as possible and offering uh, uh, those jobs and positions and programming to everyone. We always invite everyone in terms of, of pro programming. In terms of making it a permanent uh, commission, uh, I like the idea, and we have, we report back that it be, uh, that they could meet maybe quarterly or uh, semi-annually and do come back as to how we're doing on that uh, list. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see. We got a whole boatload of questions here. Um, let me see. Uh, blah, blah, blah. One role of being mayor is setting a tone for collaboration among the council members. What are your plans to support and build a strong council team? Ms. Shevlin? Uh, yes, Ed, uh, since I've been mayor, we do meet uh, quarterly uh, with the council. We have team building uh, sessions where everyone gets to voice their concerns of what they would like to concentrate on. And we work as a team then to work those things out or what we want to bring forward and work on and present to the um, community. But those have been very, uh, in fact, we're having one this month as well. Uh, that has been, I think, working very well with the um, especially with two new uh, council members uh, and educating them too as to things, how things work in the, the city and how we bring things forward. So I definitely want to continue that to meeting quarterly and, and team building events. And we also have, we have other little, uh, we have a camp out that we go on and that's very uh, nice. It's just an, an overnight in our Canyon Park and that works out very well. And I like to make blueberry pancakes in the morning. <laughs> Are there s'mores involved? Yes, there's s'mores involved. Sweet. Okay, uh, Mr. Spicer, collaborating with the council. Yes, I, I believe um, as a leader, um, as a mayor, or anyone that's in a leadership position, you have to always be listening or giving your colleagues the opportunity to really speak without, without um, how should I say this? 
It's very important that everyone is heard, okay? It's very important that everyone is heard throughout. Whatever they have to say, it needs to be heard. And if I was the mayor, whenever we have these retreats, what I would do is, is set three different things that needs to be accomplished in between the time that we meet now and the time that we meet at our next meeting. So that way, in between, we know we're accomplishing something. You have to accomplish whatever you're setting out to do. You can't just keep coming back and forth to the meeting. Having meetings, not accomplishing your goals. Thank you. Um, how do you plan to communicate with your constituents, uh, Mr. Spicer? Oh, that's a good one. I would, what, as a mayor, what I would like to do is have coffee, coffee um, with my constituents. Like once a month, I like to just gather with some friends or constituents throughout this community and just get together and just talk, you know, just lay it on the line. And if it's something that we know that we can accomplish from that meeting, well, I would bring it back to the council and we would talk about it. And if the council agreed, then we would go ahead and put it into motion once we, you know, let staff go through and do whatever they have to do. But yes, I would do it that with the, with the coffee, um, with the little coffee breaks, then I would take care of my social media and focus groups. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jeblin. Um, yes, uh, since I've been uh, serving on council and even before that, I've always made my cell number and my personal, personal cell and email available to everyone. I meet quite often with uh, constituents. Uh, I, they can call me just about any time, email me, uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, Instagram, <laughs> um, uh, next door, uh, and I will respond. I will respond as quickly as I possibly can. I think it's very important to meet people where they're at at any time they need a resolution of something, or maybe they just want to vent. I've had situations like that where someone just really wants to vent, and I will listen. That's the equal part of, and responsibility of that is to listen and always be available. But accessibility is really, really high on my list. I don't want to wait for either a coffee or, or something like that, although that's a good idea, and you can meet uh, in a public place and have more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, this is one of the ones that we that was also asked of, of the council. The city and, and the school district are different entities, but they need to work together. How would you facilitate cooperation between the city and the schools? Um, Ms. Shevlin? Uh, yes, I think that is very, very important. And I have been trying to get and working with the chamber to reinstate the Beacon Committee, Business, Education, and Community Outreach Network. And that is a combination of um, businesses, uh, school, uh, school board members or school representatives, uh, city representatives, and uh, or just citizens. And it's really an, an excellent vehicle. Uh, it stopped meeting several years ago. I'd like to reinstitute it. I think it's a very important group. And then also the chamber, the city um, uh, manager's office, and also the school superintendent. We used to meet once a month. It was the superintendent and the, um, the school board uh, president. It was the city manager and the, the mayor, and then also the director of the chamber uh, and their president as well. And I think maybe we, didn't have, we don't need to meet every month, but I think it's really important that we start those back up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Spicer. Yeah, I believe um, the collaboration with the city and the school board should be ongoing all the time, mm -hmm. continuous. I mean, every year I make sure I go down, go through the background check, get my ID um, badge, so that way I can go on campus, interact with the different um, people on the different um, school grounds. Um, I'm endorsed by the whole school board. So I know that collaboration is there. How much more we can do is hard to say. 
you know, but it's, it's so much there that we can do. Because if you have a good city, a good school, and you have the community, and that's what's going to build the whole city and make it cohesive. Thank you. A um, lot of questions tonight about affordable housing, um, and here's one that's a little different. It says, regarding HUD's six-step program for the, the procurement of land to build affordable housing, how exactly will that help Monrovia, and what land is there to procure? Uh, Mr. Spicer? Okay. So for the past year, I've been working with a gentleman from HUD, and we were putting together a six-step program towards affordable housing. Now, it's not going to be an easy step for us to accomplish, but you have to start somewhere. And so whether it's accumulating property or using a commercial building and getting it rezoned, it can happen it's just how much we want to put into it in order to get out what we really need as far as affordable housing. It can work. I've seen it work in Pasadena. I don't see why it couldn't work in Monrovia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Shevlin. Uh, yes, the, this. Oh, uh, the city of Monrovia doesn't own large parcels of property to uh, develop, but I am very proud to be a part of uh, an afford. Um, uh, founding member of the Re San Gabriel Valley Regional Housing Trust, and they have been able, in their short term, have been able to uh, fund some 857 uh, units through either the their pipeline or through their revolving um, loan program. And very important, and they're also looking at forming a land trust. They also, through um, the COG and the Regional Housing Trust, they have a housing na navigator that helps the city identify properties, identify pro possible projects that we can go forward with. Um, we are a member of the Regional Housing Trust, and those monies go to build units, affordable units, in the San Gabriel Valley or in, within the, the members uh, of the trust. <coughs> And so I really look forward. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought she said stop. At any rate, um, I think there's great opportunities. I am not aware of, and nor is the, the COG or the Regional Housing Trust of the HUD program, but I'd like to know the details. Don't keep it a secret. Uh, I don't care who's responsible or who gets the credit. Let's, let's serve our people and provide some regional um, or some affordable housing. Uh, okay, and then I guess a follow-on thing is, is um, do you support enacting inclusionary zoning um, or um, incentivizing homeowners to build accessory dwelling units, uh, things like that? So, um, Ms. Shevlin? We did. We have paid someone to um, do a survey or to do analysis of that, and it is going to be coming back to us uh, soon as to the inclusionary housing. And it, there are a lot of things to consider. I think it's really great if we can get a percentage of the units on any new development that would be uh, affordable. Um, but sometimes that makes the project itself unaffordable, and it doesn't pencil out, and so they. They walk away from that. It's a balancing act. I'm not saying yes or no. I want to know more uh, information um, on that. Uh, ADUs, I have an ADU. I think it's a great idea. And the city of uh, Monrovia has you sign a covenant that you will not use that ADU for short-term um, uh, rentals. Um, so I think that's really great. I would like to work uh, with our city staff to provide a um, pre-approved uh, pre plans for ADUs, so it would make it easier and more affordable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Spicer. Yes, ma'am. I believe um, with, what was the question again? <laughs> um, do you support inclusionary zoning? Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, and uh, incentivizing homeowners to build uh, ex accessory dwelling units? Yes. Um, my mother-in-law um, actually did an ADU. Um, in Monrovia also, but what if you, if you, I think we kind of were a little bit behind the curve because if we had an inclusionary zoning prior to all the developments that's been going on down at Station Square, 
I believe we would have had a lot of affordable housing going in prior to. And yes, I am in favor of an inclusionary um, zoning with a percentage of the homes being affordable. Um, yes, I, did, I am in favor of it, okay. Thank you. Um, and kind of in a related issue, what is your plan for Monrovia's homeless problem, Mr. Spicer? Well, you know, it goes back to, to what I was talking about regarding the gentleman, um, the owner of the commercial building. If we were able to utilize a commercial building in order to take the people off the streets, house them in that commercial building, at least we're giving them some type of um, um, cover where they can lay down and rest. But the problem is, like the gentleman was telling me, you got to deal with the drugs. How are we going to be able to put our building back in shape when we get ready to sell it or when we do sell it? Um, because the building would be going through a process of being sold. But if the, at what I was thinking about, if the city was able to utilize that building until it actually was sold and to put it back in place, it would be, you know, usable. But the problem is who's going to pay to put it back oh, together? Thank I'm you. <laughs> Ms. Shevlin. Uh, yes. In terms of housing, it's an all hands on deck. Uh, we keep on talking about doing something after it's the problem is out of hand. We need to start concentrating on prevention. Um, we need to have everyone on, on, on board. We need education. We need our workforce in, investment. We need to have make sure that we are training people to be prepared for the workforce and, and be able to earn a livable wage. Uh, we need to address mental health and substance abuse. That is really, really, really important. And try to keep people, the prevention piece, uh, from keeping people uh, from falling into uh, homelessness, which is really important. I, I'd also like to look into things, and, and again, the Regional Housing Trust, they have uh, funded uh, three different uh, tiny homes, so to speak, uh, that address interim type housing uh, for um, high acuity and also family and individuals. And they're doing a fantastic job at transitioning these groups out of those situ. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking. <laughs> I just on a roll. And I wasn't either. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this might be kind of a follow-on to homelessness, but um, tell us what you know about current mental health programs in Monrovia and what can be done to improve them. And we'll start with Ms. Shevlin. Um, yes, there is something that we haven't approved it yet, but there is a called Care Solace, which is really a concierge service for individuals that they can call and they can be referred uh, to a mental health facility. Uh, many of us, we have no no idea where to start. And so that is, I'm really hoping, and that could be uh, funded through our um, opioid settlement monies. Uh, but we also just started, and I was really, I'm very proud as a part of our San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, our homeless committee, the uh, SGV uh, Mental Health Crisis Mobile Unit uh, had its start out of that. And uh, it's still more or less, it's still in a a pilot format, but uh, it's coming to, it's now in Monrovia, and it will provide services for those people in a crisis situation, and they'll get the care they need. Um, it, it, they will come to them, but also there's follow-up as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spicer. Yeah, there's so much work that needs to be done with mental health. Um, I, I actually believe because we have, it seems like when things come up, all of a sudden you have all these break-off groups that can do this and that, right? What if we were able to bring all those groups together as one? Instead of working as separate entities, I believe we'll be, we would be able to solve the problem. The problem is you, you have all these groups that's starting up with this really good program of mental health, but... The, admin, the administrative costs cost more than taking care of the mental health people. So how is that, how are we going to solve the problem when we're paying the people 
more money than we actually putting into the programs. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions here about getting people involved. What will you do to promote civic engagement and to um, empower an, an um, active citizenry? Um, Mr. Spicer? You know, I'm a hands-on type of person. I'm really the type that like to, I like to work. You know, I'm not all about being up front, you know, taking pictures and this and that. I like to get down and dirty with the people. So um, a good leader um, lead by example, okay? And so if special cleanup days, make a difference days, we just all have to get out there. You know, you just invite the people out. If you invite the people out and have a little food, they're going to show up, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's got to be fun. You, if you make it fun, they're going to show up. Okay? They're going to show up. Okay. Um, Ms. Shevler? Uh, yes. Um, I also like to lead by example, and I like getting dirty as well. Uh, and volunteering on Make a Difference Day. I don't know that I've missed a, uh, Make a Difference Day. But how we can all make a difference is really making a personal commitment, too, to, to be involved to, um, and the city manager's update, I mean, he puts that out every week. It gives so many different opportunities and informs people. Uh, we have our MAP Leadership Academy, which is absolutely fantastic, trains people, and also a youth academy that lets you know that's how I got involved. It wasn't called the uh, MAP Leadership at the time. It was through the chamber. But at any rate, that's how I found out how to be involved. And we need to promote those ideas. And it's not just for blighted areas, the MAP um, area partnership. It's for all of us to be involved. It's for all of us to learn how we can give back and serve our community. And I think if we just continue to promote those, we do well. Thank you. OK, um, uh, please tell us your nonprofit um, organizational charity involvement in Monrovia on your, in your spare time. Um, <laughs> Ms. Ms. Shevlin? Uh, yes, I am a longstanding Monrovia Reads uh, a member that's a literacy nonprofit here in Monrovia and also partners with our library in our city to distribute books throughout uh, Monrovia and at special events. Um, they do great work, and they have a, a program called Zoophonics now that they have put into the school systems as well. We have a mobile uh, library unit, I mean, a van that goes out to the school sites, all the school sites, and um, it's a great opportunity to share uh, with our community. I'm also on the Monrovia uh, Guild of Children's Hospital Los Angeles, very involved in that as well. And many people probably don't know, but the... Um, City of Monrovia also is served by the uh, city the, or the Children's Hospital. There are many in the area, Arcadia, uh, Duarte, Monrovia, over 800 uh, children that are served every year uh, through that organization. So it's very important to give those <coughs> support to that. Uh, okay, Mr. Spicer. Yes, I'm, I'm a board member of the Monrovia Duarte Black Alumni Association, the Boys and Girls Club of Monrovia. Um, the uh, Tournament of Roses, the, um, I'm a volunteer uh, for the Sheriff Department. I'm not a police officer. I just write tickets for handicap parking. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I don't get it wrong. <laughs> so um, most of my volunteer work is here local, locally with the church and um, the Volunteer Center. That's about it. That's okay, thank you. Um, this one has to do with um, services for seniors. How do you propose to increase services for seniors, um, Mr. Spicer? Well, first of all, what I would do is I would go to, I would propose, do a proposal to the city manager and ask him how can we work in the budget to be able to feed the seniors every month from a different restaurant in the city without going and 
without going to this one care facility. Also, I would like to um, increase the amount of trips that the seniors have throughout the year. Um, the turnarounds in Vegas, I would like to see them go on those. Um, I would like to see them um, go on more, more trips to the museums, the different activities, the Norton Simon, whatever um, the community services come up with. It's just to enhance in order to give back to the seniors what they've given to us throughout their years. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sheblin. Um, yes, we just uh, purchased a, a brand new building across from the library, and it's going to be able to provide uh, lots of extra space for us to have programming uh, while the community center is being uh, renovated. But it's a very important thing to have space, additional space for the seniors to do their their uh, activities in. I think doing trips and things like that is also very important, what uh, they want to um what they decide is is important to them. Uh, they do like to play bingo. I know they complain a lot about the food, so the food <laughs> is a, is a big issue. Uh, but uh, I also think it's very important that we really work with them about their issues, whether it's uh, senior citizens have mental health issues as well, housing issues. Housing is a huge issue. The biggest growing um, uh, population of uh, homeless are seniors. And how we can help them, help help them navigate their problems. Anyone that's have to, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, this is a question that hadn't been asked uh, before. What steps do you think we should take to address police brutality um, uh, against communities of color and marginalized communities, um, Ms. Shevlin? Could you repeat the the question? Okay, it says, what steps do you think we should take to address police brutality against communities of color and marginalized communities. I know that that was covered in our diversity uh, group that uh, looked at all of our departments across the board, and specifically and especially our police department, and they did not find any of that uh, prevalent or even happening in our, our police department. Um, there was none of that uh, found, but regardless, uh, the training is tantamount, and in our police department, it's so important to have trained officers and in all aspects, and especially uh, with working with um, adverse uh, situations and how to de-escalate a situation. And so the the training is very, very, very important. And I just have to say, I took some medication, some antihistamine. My mouth is so dry, I can't stand it. <laughs> Um, but, um, um, yes, the training is probably the most important and we have great trained, um, officers and, um, like I said, they, that was covered in the, um, in the diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Spicer. We have a pretty good, um, police chief right now, um, chief San Victorias. His his so his policemen have been going around to the different churches, engaging on this on um, de-escalation. We've gone up to the police department, and we've gone through some of their um, active shooter training. And it's to me, it's all about having um, forums with the police and the citizens that gives you that open engagement. And I think that's the only way that you're going to be able to combat. Thank you. Police brutality. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, this one was something that was made, uh, done in the last forum, but uh, how much money is currently set aside in Measure K, and what are your plans for that money in the next 12 to 18 months? And uh, Mr. Spicer? Okay. Um, I know there's... There's over $16 million in there, and the concern has always been about what's going to happen to Canyon Park. Are we going to have enough money for Canyon Park? Well, I understand we took a survey, and the residents and the citizens have said these are 
these are the list of things that we would like to see happen. I agree with them, so I'm all in favor of start, starting to knock some of the things off of that list that are not too, exp um, too expensive, but yet and still maintaining that budget eye on, on making sure that we have enough money to maintain what we're going to need to do, whether it's um, the capital improvement plans over at the library, Canyon Park, we got to have the funding. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chevlin. Um, yes, uh, actually, by the end of this fiscal year, we should have 23 point Five, about $23.5 million in that Measure K uh, program. We uh, garner about 6 to $6.5 million every year on that program. And yes, uh, we have kept it in reserves. Uh, that is the plan to just not spend it right now because we were concerned about Canyon Park. It does look like we've gotten the situation in Canyon Park um, stabilized. Uh, we don't have the money in our hot little hands yet. Uh, but uh, we do want to sit back, and especially with the state budget, um, with many, many, many cuts, we want to be conservative. We also want to be able to, and we have been able to increase our reserves, which is also attributed to our increase in a our our tax rating. Uh, excuse me, our credit rating, <coughs> and it it's now up to a double A plus. So that is really great because people look at us uh, outside agencies. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, okay, this is this is something that was asked of the council also. Um, if you had one goal to complete by the end of your term, what would it be? And we'll start with Ms. Shevlin. I think uh, that everybody talks about local control, but unfortunately that local control is controlled by Sacramento. <laughs> However, to the greatest degree that we possibly can is find ways to preserve our, our resources, our natural resources, our canyon, our preservation, our uh, hillside preserves, our historic homes, to create more historic districts, because that can protect us, even with all this lo loss of uh, local control. That historic districts can be protected. And so I would like to see more uh, emphasis or monies or be able to uh, uh, help the citizens um, create those historic districts. It would be, that was, that would be one way. I'm just one person, but again, that local control component, it has to do with who we send to Sacramento because those laws are being uh, made in Sacramento and it's affecting us all on a local level. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spicer. Yes, affordable housing, Monrovia, and making Monrovia accessible for everyone, and where everyone can, um, where everyone and anyone can feel prosperity in Monrovia. That's all I ask. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. Let's see. Um, what do you think is the best way of dealing with conflict, Mr. Spicer? Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, the way you deal with it is being an um, a active listener, right? You got to, you know, if you're, if you're talking all the time, how can you hear the person problem? You know, you got to be a good listener. You got to be able to listen to them. Sometimes it takes a long time. It may take them an hour to get to where they're going. But, you know, you just listen to them, and a lot of times they feel better in the end. You know, but if I'm talking over you, well, what the hell did you come to me for, right? So that's okay. my answer. Thank you. Um, Ms. Shevlin. Yes, communication, 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 and listen, part of that is listening, being a good listener, and being accessible so that people can come and and 
air their differences. But again, I was talking about sharing of information that is so critical, so crucial for the dialogue, because if someone comes to you and they're not informed as to what the facts are or what our issues really are or what our challenges are or what our options are, then you spend so much time just butting heads and, and arguing. And so my goal is to always make sure that when we have a conversation that I can inform somebody of what the true challenges are. Many times, many people are misinformed. And I listen from their side of the, the, the table as to what they're dealing with, what their challenges are. And so we can meet somewhere in the middle and find ways to collaborate and, and really get things done. But it's all about that communication and listening. Um, okay. What will you do to make our city more welcoming to the LGBTQ community and other diverse groups? Um, Ms. Shevlin? Uh, our programs are open to everyone. I don't know of any program that we offer, whether it's for children, teens, or adults, that puts an edge on it that says you're not welcome or any group is not welcome. And I... I welcome everybody to the, the table to um, enjoy all, everything that Monrovia has to offer. Uh, and there's, if, if I've ever uh, put someone off or made them feel uncomfortable or that they weren't um, welcome, shame on me. But Monrovia, I think through all of our programming, community services, library, um, everything is open to everyone. No, no special groups, it's everyone. And to promote, obviously, uh, also programming in the library and our community services for all groups uh, as well to, to provide anything special that they, they might want or need. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Spicer? Yes, promoting um, Pride Month, having more events surrounding, um, surrounding um, Pride Month, um, I mean, this is America, you know, we got a, it's, it's something that we do for all, right? Okay. So Thanks. I would just promote it, you know, promote it just like we do everything else. Uh, it shouldn't be no problem. Thank you. Um, and this will be the last question. Um, a lot of compliments to both of you for having given so much of your time and effort to the city of Monrovia. Um, it's one of the things says you're both incumbents with similar experience. What makes you different from your opponent? And that would inspire me to vote for you. Um, Mr. Spicer. Well, my objective as your new mayor is transformation of the gold line, affordable housing plan, expansion of the senior services, reestablish Friday night teen scene, in order to get the kids from up there at Bonds, and a monthly coffee chat with the mayor. I believe having that chat with the mayor, we can sit down, iron out a lot of problems that would normally um, cause havoc at a council meeting. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe we would be able to solve a lot of um, the adversity that we have, but... Um, I think that's what sets me apart, because Colin Powell said, the day you're not solving problems, you are not up to your button problems, and it's probably a day you are no longer leading. If your desk is clean and no one is bringing you problems, <laughs> you should you. be very worried. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Shevlin. I well, had I, to get that in there. Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can guarantee you my desk is not clean. <laughs> it's very, I, I have a blur on my Zoom calls. Uh, at any rate, uh, pretty much uh, Mr. Spicer and I have voted uh, uh, the same on everything, uh, except uh, there was one item, and I took a vote of uh, no confidence with uh, George Gascon, the uh, DA, LADA. Um, and um, I also have an opportunity. I've been voted, uh, elected by the San Gabriel Valley, 31 cities, to represent the city of Monrovia and um, all the, the 31 cities with the L.A. County Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness Executive Committee. And 
it's not always all about the city of Los Angeles or the county of Los Angeles. It's about us, the cities. And I have that opportunity to be the voice for us to stand up and talk about how our Measure H dollars get spent and how our services are distributed. And it's very important that we have that voice. Thank you. And so this ends the uh, audience question period, and we'll go to a closing statements, and uh, we'll start with Ms. Shevlin. Um, thank you. I didn't pre prepare something very specific. I, I truly think I said it pretty much all in my opening statement and in my comments tonight. I serve you. I serve the citizens of Monrovia, and I've been doing it for a long time, and I've enjoyed every single minute of it. And I give of my time, my effort, my commitment, my passion. You are my passion. And I do think that I stand out. I, I have a wealth of uh, experience and leadership style. And I do have the opportunity, as I just said, being able to represent the city of Monrovia and the San Gabriel Valley in getting to say what goes on between the city of L.A. and the uh, county of Los Angeles, we need our own voice as well. And I do have that opportunity. But if I'm not sitting as mayor, that goes away. I, I won't have that uh, opportunity. I've also had many, many different uh, opportunities through regional boards, either uh it's many from the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector that I haven't uh, mentioned today that the Foothill Transit Board um, and obviously the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments and many committees, uh, the Regional Housing Trust, the Capital Improvement uh, Projects uh, Committee as well through the San Gabriel Valley COG. Thank you. Thank you. Vote, <laughs> Mr. Spicer, you're So closing? all of my work is here in Monrovia. Ladies and gentlemen, and esteemed residents of Monrovia, tonight we've engaged in a crucial dialogue about the future of our beloved city. We've heard diverse perspectives, passionate arguments, and thoughtful proposals. In Monrovia, we share a common vision, a vibrant, inclusive, and prosperous city where every individual can strive. While we may have different approaches, let us not forget about our goal remains the same, to serve the best interests of our residents and ensure a bright future for generations to come. As your potential mayor, I stand committed to fostering collaboration, transparency, and accountability in city government, government. I believe in listening to the voices of all residents, prioritizing equity and justice, and making decisions that reflect the collective aspirations of our community but beyond the rhetoric of campaigns and debates okay thank you <laughs> that's it <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's all good yeah <laughs> okay so um this ends the mayoral portion of this forum um in closing uh, i want to thank you very much for taking the time to be part of this forum as we stated earlier the league's voter service goal is to promote an informed and involved electorate uh, we hope that we have succeeded in helping you be better informed about your choices in this election uh, but now we have to turn things over to you for the involved part Please participate in our democracy by casting your vote. You may vote by mail as soon as you get your ballot. I've already got mine. Um, to vote by mail, make sure you sign your ballot envelope. Don't forget to do that. You can drop uh, your ballot into the U.S. mail. It must be postmarked no later than March 5th. And you can put it into any ballot drop box um, by March 5th. And the closest drop box is at the Monrovia Library. And you can vote in person beginning February 24th at the Monrovia Library. And then beginning March 2nd, you can also vote in person at the Monrovia High School or Santa Anita YMCA. Um, and we actually have a flyer out front from the league that you can use the QR code to get all the information from the um, county registrar's uh, your voting information. So that's all we have to say, except for remember that the world is run by people who show up. So thank you very much. Thank you again on behalf of the Monrovia Chamber of Commerce for coming tonight. Thank you to all of our candidates in attendance, and thank you to the League of Women Voters very much for helping us facilitate this forum. Good night, everyone.